Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so it's really a pleasure for me to introduce our, our visitor this evening, Ken Moss, who's really one of the shining lights in the field of modern Jewish history, which is uh, my own field. Um, and it's uh, just terrific to be able to welcome him to the Brown campus and have, us, uh, have him here among us. Um, Professor Moss is Associate Professor uh, and Felix Posen Chair of Modern Jewish History in the Department of History um, at Johns Hopkins um, and Director uh, of the Leonard and Helen R. Stolman Program in Jewish Studies. And you might have among the longest titles I've ever heard. There's a lot of names. There's three or four lines right, under exactly. my email signature. Um, he comes to uh, a with a PhD from Stanford, which he received in 2003, uh, but also a BA from Rutgers, where his advisor was our very own Omar Bartok, who's here. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> training generations of guiding lights in their field. We have a few others of his students in the room as well. Uh, Professor Moss is author of Jewish Renaissance and the Russian Revolution, um, which was published by Cambridge, uh, at, excuse me, Harvard University Press in 2009, and which won the 2010 Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature by the National Jewish Book Council. Uh, his current project, which I think he's speaking from today, uh, is entitled The Unchosen People, the Jewish, the Polish Jewish Condition and the Jewish Political Imagination, 1928 to 1939. Uh, he has the usual, if you glance at his CV, lists of publications, numerous articles in many journals uh, um, and uh, collected volumes, um, and a number of grants and fellowships, including from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the uh, American Council of Learned Societies, the Davis Center for Russian Studies at Harvard, you're getting the picture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as, in addition, this fall he's taken on the role as co-editor in the um, important journal in the field, Jewish Social Studies. So it's really a great honor to welcome Professor Moss here today with a talk entitled Zionism, Palestinism, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Post-diasporism, new forms of Polish-Jewish political thinking in the 1930s. Thank you and welcome. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that really terrific introduction. I think I won't leave, you know, but then thank you so much for coming out. And I'm delighted to see everyone and see such a, a large audience, but at least by the standards uh, we're used to at Hopkins, it's terrific. Um, okay, in early 1935, Dr. Werner Sonata of the Zionist Executive in Palestine wrote a letter to his old acquaintance, Isaac Gitterman, the chief representative of the Joint Distribution Committee in Poland. Sonata's goal, was to tap for Zionism, the support, and the money of figures in the Jewish world who did not consider themselves Zionists but felt some sympathy for its efforts to create a Jewish national community in British Mandatory Palestine. Gitterman's task as an agent of the JDC, or as everyone knew at the Joint, was to distribute American Jewish monies for Jewish economic reconstruction in Poland. And in keeping with the policy of the Joint, he worked with all elements of the deeply divided Polish Jewish community, Zionists and diasporists, secularists and Orthodox Jews, nationalists and integrationists. Sonata had good reasons to write to Gitterman because as the head of the joint in Poland, Gitterman was in touch with every part of Polish Jewry and a unique position to know which way the ideological winds were blowing. Sonata's question to Gitterman was a modest one, whether, in his estimation, it made sense to expand efforts by the Zionist movement in Palestine to reach out to sympathetic non-Zionist Jewish Poles in the small Polish Jewish economic elite. Gitterman's response, sent back in a private capacity, is arresting. Sonata, he said, was thinking far too narrowly in his focus on circles who were already friendly to Zionism. He was missing a much larger ideological shift in Polish Jewish life. In Gitterman's view, many Polish Jews who yesterday were, quote, distant or even hostile to Zionism, were now psychologically ready and even eager to take part in what he called a practical Palestinist movement. This included substantial parts of the Warsaw Jewish, quote, financial aristocracy, end quote, and more strikingly, quote, the substantial majority of the Jewish intelligentsia in Poland. Now, personally, Isaac Gitterman was a critic of Zionism. He had no reason to inflate its attractions. And this in itself renders his response especially interesting. Even more interesting was his emphatic claim that Polish Jews were attracted not to Zionism, but to Palestinism as a program. Gitterman was not alone in using this peculiar term. In the course of the early 1930s, the term came to be a recognizable one in the Polish-Jewish political lexicon and public life. In 1934, the erstwhile Yiddishist diasporist Zelik Kalmanowicz wrote privately to a friend in the U.S. that the once diasporist youth of Jewish Vilna 
had universally abandoned diasporism and were now divided into two camps, quote, Palestinists and Birobajanists. In early 1936, the Polish Zionist leader Apollary Hartglas complained bitterly about the rise of, quote, Palestinism, a new creation on the Jewish street, end quote, at the expense, as he saw it, of real Zionism. This same complaint could be found within grassroots Zionism. In a 1934 autobiography, an adolescent author complained that whereas he was a true Zionist who wanted to, quote, make Aliyah to the land of Israel, end quote, his comrades simply wanted to emigrate to Palestine. Contemporaries invoked this term Palestinism to capture their impression of an emerging ideological and political reorientation in Polish Jewish life. Gitterman's letter and Hartglass's complaint help us to better understand what that was. Gitterman attributed the growing Palestinism of Polish Jewry to two factors, quote, the rise of open and concealed Nazism in Europe and the broadened absorptive possibilities of Palestine, end quote. Hartglass complained that Palestinism involved a vision of mass resettlement of Polish Jews in Palestine as they were, without any social and psychic transformation in accordance with canons of the Zionist revolution. What these sources point to is a reorientation defined not by Zionist ideals of any sort, but by two new political facts looming ever larger in the 1930s. First, a widespread sense among Polish Jews that their community faced profound crisis, not least due to the flourishing of new kinds of aggressive, extrusionary anti-Semitism in Europe and around the globe. And second, the fact that in the early 1930s, Palestine suddenly became the most accessible place, accessible place for would-be Jewish immigrants, and at the same time, the once small Jewish national settlement in Palestine, the Yishuv, was rapidly emerging as a socially and economically ramified Jewish society of a new sort, as a new place and a real place. Connected to both these facts, were emerging prognoses about the Jewish future, both that of the Yeshuv and, even more so, that of the diaspora. This resonant distinction between Zionism and Palestinism opens up the topic I will address today, the places and meanings of Zionism and of the Yeshuv in the political thinking of non-Zionists in Poland and Eastern Europe, more generally between the wars, and especially in the 1930s. Before I go any further, I need to offer a series of preliminary remarks. First, let me set the stage for those less familiar with Polish Jewish history generally, and I understand there are many in the room who know quite a lot, and perhaps others who, who might wish to be reminded of a few things. Uh, so bear with me. The new Poland, the re-emergent Polish state of 1918, had a Jewish population of over 3 million, who made up some 10% of the population. Deeply divided internally, as I said, these Jews were also, in large measure, an identifiably distinct minority in a framework where ethnic difference could not escape politicization. Poland was a multi-ethnic society of Poles, Ukrainians, Jews, Germans, and Belarusians, depending on who you ask, all embedded within a state that on the one hand granted all of its citizens substantial freedoms of political organization and expression, yet on the other hand was avowedly a nation state, a state controlled and administered by people committed above all to the cultivation and protection of Polish nationhood. This nationalist vision was itself one of the more complicated ones in Eastern Europe. Polish nationalism had long entertained conflicting visions of the relationship between ethnicity and nation. In the 19th century, many Polish nationalists had conceived the Polish nation as a political entity that could make room for Jews and other others as long as they adopted the Polish language, Polish culture, and the Polish liberation struggle. But by the end of the 19th century, this supra-ethnic ideal in Polish nationalism was challenged and increasingly displaced, though never fully, by an ethnicist nationalism of the right that demanded a Poland for the Poles and increasingly came to see Jews and other national minorities as a dangerous national problem. The conflict between these two visions within Polish nationals' political culture intersected in turn with an intense conflict between socialist and integral nationalist principles, so that the Poland that re-emerged in 1918 was characterized by a fractious politics of left nationalists, or as they called themselves, the patriotic left versus right nationalists, which a coup from the center left in 1926 only partially contained. Poland also faced severe economic challenges even before the early onset of the Great Depression there. Within this framework, Jewish political identity was a matter of political and existential contention from the beginning and was inescapably cast in terms of national minorityhood. In this context of, on the one hand, unprecedented freedom of political organization and, on the other, fraught communal political identity, it was inevitable that Jewish public life in Poland would be characterized by an intense and divisive search for answers in the political realm, 
Indeed, so politically divided was interwar Polish Jewry that its history is sometimes told as a set of four separate histories of four separate political camps. Zionists, who cast the Jews as a nation in exile, bearing the same collective rights as other nations, versus Jewish integrationists, who aspire to a Polish political and cultural identity, versus Orthodox circles, particularly Hasidic circles, who sought to protect Jewish tradition and traditional Jewish difference as they saw it, versus Jewish socialists of various sorts, who envisioned the fusion of Jews into a new revolutionary society, or who, like the Jewish Socialist Bund, envisioned some sort of sustained Jewish secular cultural identity in the diaspora within the framework of social revolution. Each of these movements had its own political party or parties, its own newspapers, schools, youth movements. So there is certainly something to this model of a Polish Jewry sharply divided into four separate political cultural camps. That said, part of my goal today is to move beyond this model quite vigorously. Tonight I want to offer a history of political culture and political thought that focuses on a world of thought that was largely outside the organized movements, the world of thinking, as I said, in relation to Zionism and the Yeshuv among people who were not Zionists in the 1930s. And here, a second preliminary comment regarding the, the empirical grounds, broadly speaking, on which I base this approach. Uh, in a nutshell, there was clearly massive, if ambient, interest in Zionism and in the Yeshuv well beyond the ranks of the party faithful especially in the 1930s, and this interest was clearly substantially independent from full-fledged commitment to one or another version of organized Zionist ideology. Zionism as an organized political force in Polish Jewish life suffered a massive setback in the late 1920s from which it never really recovered. Between 1926 and 1927, the number of Polish Jews who bought the shekel, that is, became formal members of the World Zionist Movement for a fairly nominal fee, dropped from 110,000 to a mere 10,670. But if party Zionism went from political predominance in the 1920s to embattled subculture in the 1930s in Poland, other developments tell us a dramatically different story. Most dramatic was the influx of tens of thousands of young people into Polish Zionist youth organizations and particularly into Hechalutz, the pioneer organization that promised to ready them for the rigors of a life of labor, Hebraism, and national commitment in the institutional framework of the ascendant socialist Zionist camp in Palestine. The numbers are vague, ranging from 40,000 circa 1933 to Antony Polonsky's recent estimate of 70 to 100,000 over the course of the 1930s. But what is beyond doubt is the incredible disproportion between the very anemic party membership in organized Zionist parties in the 1930s, with the possible exception of the revisionist movement, we can talk about that, and on the other hand, massive engagement in Zionist youth movements and emigration preparatory movements. Add to this a great deal of adult interest in the same. Uh, Irit Chernyavsky's recent dissertation records that by 1939, the Palestine office in Warsaw that handled inquiries by Polish Jews wishing to leave for Palestine had a card file of some 200,000 separate names. Now let us note immediately that much of the impetus for joining these movements was in the first instance not related to Palestine per se, as far as we can tell, but rather above all provoked by the desire simply to get out of Poland, coupled with the unforeseen eventuality that in 1932 the British mandatory authority in Palestine reopened Palestine to large-scale Jewish immigration at a moment when other destinations around the world were closed, like the U.S., or were closing. And here, tangentially, let me just say that there's a, an as-yet unreconstructed history of a general Polish-Jewish emigrationism or a, a kind of politics of exit in search of a destination which intersects closely with my talk tonight and that I'd be happy to revisit in our discussion later. For now though, note that however much the initial impetus for joining these movements was a sort of pure politics of exit, it would be wrong to treat this massive interest in Zionism among wide swaths of the population purely as a practical choice with no dimension of political reflection or thought. The body of my talk tonight will, I hope, demonstrate this quite clearly, but for now suffice it to say that this widespread communal engagement with Zionism as emigrationism intersected with an equally widespread interest among large numbers of Polish Jews well beyond Zionist circles in the life, achievements, and travails of the new Jewish society emerging in Palestine. Public interest in the Yeshuv included both the dramas of Yeshuv life and its everyday features the June 1933 murder in Tel Aviv of labor Zionism's rising political star, Chaim Lozov, touched off fierce debate and even violence uh, across Polish Jewry well beyond Zionist circles. At the same time, there was strong interest in the everyday life of Palestinian Jewry, 
and in such central aspects of the Yishuv Zionist project as Tel Aviv, the first Jewish city, and in the kibbutz movement. Many Polish Jews traveled to Palestine on tours in the early 1930s. Some used their tourist visas simply as cover for illegal immigration, but others went as actual tourists. And these benefited from an increasingly regularized tourist agenda that combined traditional pilgrimage sites with Zionists or New Yeshuv sites and attainments. Back in Poland, not only the Zionist daily newspaper, Heint, but also the broadly non-Zionist mass circulation daily Moment offered regular and detailed coverage of Jewish life in Palestine already in the 1920s. Contemporaries all testify to this popular interest. One pro-Bundist and quite anti-Zionist commentator commented in passing in 1935 that there was no need to provide much background information about the Yishuv because everyone in Poland has already been talking about it and is familiar with its ins and outs. In short, the early 1930s give us a situation, or confront us with a situation, of widespread Polish Jewish desire to leave, the suddenly renewed possibility that Palestine was the most feasible choice of destination, and widespread ambient and multiform interest in Zionism or in the Yishuv among large groups of people distant from the organized movements. My goal tonight is to investigate this last dimension, and in so doing, to offer a new perspective on Polish Jewish political culture in the 1930s. Before I can finally turn to the body, let me make two more preliminary comments. First, what are the stakes of the analysis I will sketch tonight? As you know, or can no doubt guess, much of the history writing about interwar Polish Jewry has been deeply shaped by a set of painful and perennial meta-historical questions, pivoting around the question, toward what future was Polish Jewry heading in the interwar period, and what would have happened to it had the Holocaust not occurred? Embedded in this question, what was the nature of Polish-Jewish relations? And where were they headed? Was Poland headed toward the triumph of extrusionary anti-Semitism? Or might the liberal national or native socialist traditions have triumphed, bringing with them a new kind of Polish-Jewish fusion? Even more central, was the Zionist analysis of the Jewish condition correct or faulty or even part of the problem? And conversely, should we instead revisit the diaspora analysis for unacknowledged insights? Some of you may have seen an especially crude performance of these stakes last year in the New York Times of all places, where an American historian of Polish culture used the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to publish an op-ed contending that the Bund's position may have been the most reasonable and that attempts to say otherwise are, quote, teleological, end quote. So those are the stakes. I won't pretend to be indifferent to them, but I will suggest that we can get past the threefold morass of mere argument about teleology, mere argument about how strong anti-Semitism was or wasn't in Poland, and mere argument about the relative popularity and reasonableness of each movement within Polish Jewish life, if we begin from two well-established but largely unmobilized facts about the nature of Polish Jewish political culture in the 1930s. First, very many, and probably most Polish Jews, were not card-carrying convinced members of any Jewish party. There are strong grounds to see this as a politically labile community, more characterized by a search for answers than by clear convictions. And this is especially true of the generation coming of age in the 1930s. Second, and to my mind a key point, the questions that trouble us today and that we regard as meta-historical questions about where Polish Jewry was headed, about what future was becoming present in the 1930s and what lay beyond, these were questions that urgently preoccupied contemporaries themselves. I would argue that the defining posture of much Polish Jewish political culture in the 1930s was not certainty, but uncertainty. Uncertainty about the future, uncertainty about which factors, local and global, economic and political, would most determine Jewish life chances, uh, uncertainty about whether there was a way out. And this uncertainty should be the starting point for our analysis of Jewish political thought in the 1930s. Now, of course, the sense that the future was in crisis in the 1930s was hardly limited to Jews. We could say that it was the defining condition of most people's experience around the globe in that grim era. But the future was, especially, was perhaps especially opaque for Jews, or at any rate, it certainly was opaque for Jews in particular ways. Two perceived threats loomed large in the East European Jewish Im imagination in the early 1930s, with the relationship between these two threats being the crux of the matter and the kind of imponderable, to use the term of the times, uh, on which a lot of Jewish thought pivoted. First, the threat of permanent economic ruination. And second, the threat that a new form of anti-Semitism would forcibly extrude Jews from Polish society, economy, and culture. 
The first of these was in the first instance general to the region and indeed the globe. Jews in Eastern Europe shared in the bitter fruits of the crisis of global capitalism that afflicted the still largely agrarian economies of Eastern Europe with special force. Already by early 1929, the small business sector in which Jews were disproportionately located was in free fall. The Jewish small town and artisanal economy was especially dire. And by 1939, one out of three Jews in Poland was dependent on charity. But again, these are fairly typical grim statistics uh, if you think globally. The question of whether the economy would recover was the same question that confronted many others around the globe, many of whom were in even worse condition. But it was complicated for Jews by the separate question of whether their future would be permanently affected and foreclosed by anti-Semitism, no matter what happened in the economic realm. Now, to pronounce too forcefully on this subject would simply plunge us back into the endless debates about Poles and Jews, what would have happened to Polish political culture had X, Y, and Z not occurred, and I certainly don't want to do that here. I would simply cite several fairly indisputable facts as a way of thinking about the sorts of problems Jews were thinking about in the 1930s, rightly or wrongly. So first, the late 1920s and early 1930s saw the emergence of a more aggressive and encompassing strain of political and existential anti-Semitism on the Polish national right. It's fairly un uncontroversial. This anti-Semitism was not only intermittently more violent than it had been before, but also, and this is probably more striking to Jewish observers at the time, it was more coherent and far-reaching ideologically. It posited the Jews as an intrinsically destructive element that had to be contained or ideally ejected from Polish society, culture, and polity for the sake of the Polish nation. Moreover, and perhaps even more worrisome to observers, there was strong evidence visible at the time that this idea of Jews' objective indigestibility and the implication that at least a large number of them needed to be disgorged was beginning to spread well beyond the nationalist right. We find one potent example in an in-depth 1932 study of the political attitudes of some 500 non-coms, non-commissioned officers, in the Corpus Ochroni Pogranicza, the Border Protection Corps. This was a unit directly under the Ministry of Internal Affairs that had been thoroughly reorganized by the ruling Senazi regime in 1929 and thus might have been expected to be a bastion of the Senazi's relatively tolerant version of Polish patriotism. The study was conducted as a side project in the context of a very elaborate correspondence course on citizenship in which the 500 officers wrote extensive and open essays about their visions of Poland, their hopes and attitudes, and the like. What the study found, to the evident dismay of the authors, who were also Senazi types, broadly speaking, was that, quote, a large majority of our students, to whom national chauvinism ought to be alien by dint of their profession and of the educational influences to which they are directly subject, end quote, were actually convinced of the essential, quote, maliciousness of the Jews. The large majority of the officers saw their Polish Jewish neighbors as atavistically committed to, quote, activity damaging to Poles, hatred toward Christians, international influence, support of Bolshevism, exploitation, economic maliciousness, spiritual and physical strangeness, and a tendency toward slovenliness, end quote. These findings captured a trend in Polish political culture that was especially alarming to Polish Jews. Here was an anti-Semitism that was not confined to the radical right. It was not anti-modern in its own eyes or formally irrational in character. In fact, the officers sort of spoke about themselves as quite secular people and pointed to the religious fanaticism of the Jews they were uh, so suspicious of. Um, uh, it was not confined to the economic realm, and it was spreading within an organ under direct state control. Now, again, my point here is not to assess the real relative weight of this phenomenon and say this was 10% representative or 90% representative. Right? I just want to underscore something much more straightforward, that Polish Jews thought a lot about both of these frightening situations, the economic and the political, and they wrestled with the question of whether they would intersect fatefully, whether in a Poland subjected to undeniably grave economic and political pressures, this potent political anti-Semitism would spill over its old boundaries, recast Polish political culture generally, and become, in essence, social policy. Jewish economic collapse might be rendered permanent by a concerted effort to keep Jews out, and this might be added cultural and political exclusion. And in the early 30s, these worries were fed not only by events in Poland, but also by the victory of, of Nazism in Germany in 33, and fascism in Austria in 34, which shocked Polish Jews, particularly on the left. And these questions loomed especially large for Jewish young people on the cusp of adulthood, career, and family life. So within this final, with this final framework in place, I can return to the main focus, the many-sided 
sometimes quite surprising place of thinking about and with Zionism and the Yeshuv in 1930s Polish Jewish political culture. The rest of the talk here has three parts. I will first return <laughs> to tracing specific trajectories within non-Zionist thought about Zionism, leaping off from this term Palestinism. I will then turn to a close study of two especially interesting cases of non-Zionist thinking with and through Zionism, and I will close with what I call the emerging political culture of post-diasporism. So first, back to the world of thought of which the term Palestinism was symptomatic. What I would underscore first is the way the early 1930s marked perhaps the first moment that Zionism could cease to be a mere idea and an experiment and instead appear as a fact. The reopening of Palestine to Jewish mass immigration in 1932 led to the doubling of Palestine's Jewish population in a scant four years, from some 180,000 to what would eventually be 400,000 in 39, most of whom came in this so-called Fifth Aliyah period. This demographic transformation was matched by institutional maturation, an explosion of competing political, social, cultural, and physical developments on the ground in Palestine. As Gitterman's letter to Senator suggested, this rapid and indeed unforeseen development of the Yeshuv drove growing numbers of Polish Jews to think about it perhaps for the first time, not within the framework of Zionist ideals or anti-Zionist critiques, but as a real Jewish society that might have a place for them. As a 1935 article in Moment put it, the Polish Jewish tourists who came to Palestine want to see, quote, the colonies, the kibbutzes, yeah, the kibbutzim, the new cities, Jewish settlement in the Emek, the Dead Sea, because they have read so much about this, and it is no wonder that they want to be convinced that everything they have read is really correct, end quote. There's also a story of social networks here, beyond ideology, when we find for numerous examples of young people attracted to the yeshuv, above all because a relative, often an older brother or a sister, had gone before them and wrote back to say they were making a more satisfying life there. So again, it's about the facticity of a place, not about one's stance on uh, the nature of galut. Um, a second idea that resonated with many Polish Jews was the view that the yeshuv possessed or offered a kind of security that allowed Jews to live free of fear or shame. One anti-Zionist observer admitted in 1935 that rightly or wrongly, being in Palestine gave young Polish Jews, quote, a sense of not being among strangers, end quote. The power of this idea could also work against Zionism, of course. One of the deepest worries for Zionist observers of the diaspora in 1929, and again in 1936 in the context of large-scale anti-Jewish violence, inter-ethnic violence, was that the appearance of Jewish weakness in Palestine, the idea that the Yushuv was in fact no different for the diaspora, upset diaspora Jews especially deeply. In 1936, a kibbutz movement emissary, one Aleph Gershom, warned the, warned the Histadrut back in Palestine that Yeshuv military restraint vis-a-vis -vis mounting attacks on Jewish targets in the context of the Arab revolt was dangerous because, quote, many see in this weakness on our part. And visible dependence on the British is equally dangerous. In Poland, this has great influence and weakens us, end quote. Third, growing numbers of Polish Jews Imagine Palestine as a place where real and permanent achievement, individual achievement, was possible in a way that was somehow permanently foreclosed in the diaspora. This was an attitude that received agonized attention from diasporists, as you might guess. In 1935, the Vilna philologist turned social psychologist Max Weinreich, a staunch diasporist, Yiddishist, sometimes supporter of the Bund, wrote a richly sourced and important study of Polish Jewish youth called Der Weg zur Jugend. Weinreich was this, uh, the, the path to our youth. Weinreich was at this point a staunch anti-Zionist, so his comments on Zionism among Polish Jewish youth are quite jaundiced, but often quite revealing. Thus, in noting the attraction of both the Yeshuv and also the Soviet Union for Polish Jewish youth, who despaired of a future in Poland, he insisted that this attraction was really merely economic, since both places happened to offer work at the present moment and Poland didn't. But Weinreich was too serious a sociologist to miss the paradox that while Jewish youth wanted to leave Poland because it offered so little economic opportunity, they were willing to embrace manual labor in Palestine or the Soviet Union. Quote, one asks oneself, why are they willing to be a garbage man in Tel Aviv or a road paver in Magnitogorsk, while in Vilna they wouldn't take such work even if it were available? And of course it wasn't because it was municipal work that would not be given to Jews. The reason, Weinreich angrily admitted, lay in a widespread sense that there was a future in Palestine that was not to be expected in Poland. In other words, we're dealing here with interest in the Yeshuv without any investment in the internal cultural aspirations of Zionism. What mattered was the fact of the Yeshuv as an alternative kind 
uh, or alternative space of possibility for Jewish individuals. Let me now turn to my second main theme, the way in which new images of the Yeshuv and its possibilities interacted with new forms of thinking about the diaspora and the global political situation in which Jews were embedded. In 1933, Yosef Chernochov traveled from Vilna to Palestine after a 22-year hiatus. Chernochov was a leader of the territorialist movement, a movement that sought a territory for mass resettlement of East European Jews and that was locked in a relationship of competition, often quite, violent, quite uh, vitriolic, with Zionism and with diasporism alike. Chernochov was deeply impressed by what he found uh, in, after his absence of 22 years. He was especially impressed by the Yeshuv's ability to shape Palestine's infrastructure according to Jewish national interests. Growing networks of roads designed to serve British imperial interests could be used to, uh, uh, were turned to the Yeshuv's own territorial con uh, cons consolidation by the Histadrut's bus system, the Eged system. Uh, he saw in this unique concrete steps by Jews, he saw in this unique concrete steps by Jews toward infrastructural power, power to shape a territory for the needs of the national community, which couldn't be found anywhere in the diaspora. Chernochov saw little hope for the creation of a Jewish state, given the economic and above all the ethnic facts of life in Palestine. But he was convinced that Zionism had secured a unique territorial achievement. Quote, everything aside, nevertheless, they've managed to get a sort of Jewish canton in the land of Israel. And within this canton, he suggested, Jewish life was lived with a certainty of purpose and a kind of freedom that could not be found in the diaspora. Quote, how much elemental joy there is in all matters. What is going on here is unlike what is going on in other Jewish communities. End quote. An even more striking set of observations about the Yeshuv, territory, ethnic concentration, and the state underway, the Medina Baderich, is to be found in, the in a 1935 Palestine travelogue by the aforementioned and much less sympathetic Max Weinreich. Weinreich, as I noted, had written about Polish-Jewish young people's attraction to Zionism before, but he had done so in ways wholly in the service of his own diasporist and Bundist sentiments. The organizing principle of Weinreich's treatment of Zionism among, among Polish-Jewish youth in his earlier writings in the 1930s was psychological reduction. Zionism, he insisted, was merely escapist fantasy, end quote. The land of Israel offers the promise of one's own nation-state life, with Hebrew letters on the stamps, with Hebrew labels on the factory blueprints, with Jewish policemen even. The entirety is actually quite small, but it awakens hopes for something greater, and I, Chaim, or Chana, can also be there in it, end quote. At various junctures, Feinreich characterized this ostensible escapism as a form of what he called autism, meaning here complete self-absorption. At other junctures, he accused Polish-Jewish young people attracted to Zionism of betraying Polish Jewry as a whole. Then Weinreich decided to travel to Palestine himself in late 1935. He took the occasion to write a dense and detailed work of reportage about his journey. In these reports from Palestine, by contrast with his earlier book, Der Weg zu Jugend, Weinreich allowed his readers, and perhaps himself, to consider whether Polish-Jewish Zionism was more than fantasy, and to confront the question of whether the Yeshuv offered concrete possibilities of Jewish self-determination that the, that the diaspora, especially in Eastern Europe, did not. In so doing, he put under scrutiny his own core diaspora nationalist conviction that a distinct territory with a concentrated Jewish population was not necessary to sustain a full and self-determining Jewish national life. Weinreich considered competing claims of Zionism and diasporism at several junctures in his detailed reportage, of which I will focus on two. The first issue in question was the touchy issue of self-defense. 1935 had brought a series of attacks against Jews in Poland, and Jews who had engaged in self-defense had been punished for doing so by the justice system. So the question of self-defense was on Weinreich's mind. During visits to Kibbutz Ein Harod and other kibbutzim, he was confronted by the claim that the Jews of Palestine were more confident and more willing to take up arms in self-defense than Jews in the diaspora. Faced with this claim, Weinreich first set about demolishing what he saw as the Zionist myth that somehow living in the land of Israel made Jews healthier, stronger, and freer. While he voiced his admiration for the readiness of the kibbutz Nakim to fight, he insistently dismantled the Zionist claim by offering readers a history lesson on how Jews in Eastern Europe had in fact organized self-defense efforts much earlier in the face of the pogroms, uh, had in fact shaped the self-defense efforts of uh, early uh, Jewish immigrants to Palestine and continued to defend themselves where they could. But significantly, Weinreich did not allow himself the easy route of pretending that Zionism's claims about the political, political significance of Palestine for Jews were reducible to the myths that accompanied them. 
Instead, he had the intellectual fortitude to face the question that followed. If indeed there was nothing specific to the land or the psychology it bred that could explain Palestinian Jewry's commitment to self-defense, why was it that East European Jewish self-defense efforts in the present were so much less developed than those that the Yeshuv had been preparing since 1929? The answer, Weinreich told readers, lay in differences of political and legal regime. In Palestine, Jews had a recognized right to self-defense, and the British themselves had allowed Jewish settlements to stockpile weapons for emergency use. In Eastern Europe, by contrast, the states actively undermined Jewish self-defense organizations. Quote, this means that Jewish self-defense can only be underground and necessarily has facing it both the hooligans and the police, end quote. Even more important, he argued later, was that Jewish youth in Eastern Europe did not possess equal rights to carry and use weapons. And this, coupled with the fact that Jews were generally not allowed into the various national officer corps, also worked against the kinds of organizational and material factors necessary for self-defense. In making this eminently rational case, however, Weinreich swept aside the irrational dimensions of Zionism only to foreground one of its most compelling rational arguments. Differences in legal regime, in the behavior of the police, in government policy, in short, differences in the behavior of the state were the most fundamental determinants of such life and death matters as whether Jews could defend themselves effectively. Given that the vast majority of Weinreich's cherished East European Jewish diaspora now found itself under the rule of increasingly anti-Semitic nationalist regimes, with still more radical rightists projecting their growing power into the streets, not least through growing violence, Weinreich's argument was in fact a devastating political critique of his own diasporism's actual prospects. Weinreich came close to acknowledging this when he ended with this painfully lame sentiment, quote, we hope that in other lands these conditions will change for the better, end quote. Elsewhere in the travelogue, Weinreich allowed the compelling articulation of a second dimension of Zionism's claims on behalf of the Yeshuv superiority as a site of Jewish national life. The framework of this articulation was the question of whether the building of Tel Aviv merited the, merited the excitement that so many visitors felt upon seeing this first Jewish city. And Weinreich didn't think much of it. He said there were fewer phones in Vilna and it was very dirty, <laughs> which was true. What excited them, Weinreich noted, was what Tel Aviv suggested about undimmed or replenished Jewish national capacities to create something new and significant on a large scale. Weinreich had a ready diasporous answer to this, quote, I must admit that I do not find this compelling. That Jews are capable not only of building a city, but also of building even greater things, I do not doubt. The entire question is whether we are given a chance to show what we can do. Thus, an avowedly diaspora nationalist avowal of Jewish capacities merely awaiting the right chance. But here the text takes a striking term, quote, and if someone should say, but look, isn't Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, the only land in the world where Jews are given such a chance to develop themselves? Where they wish to, they can build their own villages and establish a socialist lifestyle there. If they want to, they are allowed to build whole city quarters for themselves in Haifa and Jerusalem. And thus they are both more secure in their life and property, and their culture is rendered more secure. Where else do Jews have such opportunities for development? Were someone to speak to me thus, using the existence of Tel Aviv as evidence to support Zionism, I could accept it or not, but I would certainly understand it, because the argument has a lot of logic and a lot of demonstrability. In general, it is this that constitutes the great power of Zionism as opposed to other Jewish programs, the fact that others must appeal more to theory, while Zionism has much to show." End quote. Two features of this text deserve comment. First, Weinreich here invents an interlocutor whom he allows to challenge him directly and in a compelling fashion. The interlocutor elaborates both the positive claim on behalf of mandatory Palestine's provision of opportunities for Jewish collective action and national life, and the accompanying challenge to diasporist hopes about East European Jewry. Where else do Jews have such opportunities for development? Weinreich admits that he has no easy answer to the claim. Second, Weinreich allowed his imaginary Zionist interlocutor to articulate a further claim that struck at the theoretical heart of diasporism too, the argument shared by Zionists and territorialists of all stripes that the concentration of Jews in compact territories was a more nationally productive and even a more physically secure mode of organizing Jewish national life than the situation of near universal minority in which East European Jews found themselves. In other words, the encounter with the Yeshuv could compel non-Zionists as well to rethink not only the claims of Zionism, but also the realism of their own competing hopes about Jewish life in the diaspora. And this brings me to the third and final part of my discussion, which I'll call post-diasporism. At an interesting juncture, in the first of, two works of, report, of, of the first of the two works of reportage I discussed, that of Chernochov, the author allows one of his real named interlocutors in Palestine to raise a painful challenge to diasporist hopes in expressly political terms, quote, 
You know, I'm also not in agreement with how one often speaks and writes about the diaspora here in the land of Israel and Palestine. But answer honestly, now, in the atmosphere and perspective of our era, after the death of liberalism and the death throes of humanist socialism, does the diaspora really have another choice? Does it have a national ideal, even a limited objective possibility of national creation? End quote. We can find similar lines of reasoning among many different Polish Jewish publics and not just among intellectuals. A 1934 autobiography by a Polonized young man with a higher education focuses until the very end almost exclusively on his concrete economic problems and those concrete economic problems afflicting Polish Jewish youth who aspire to a career. Then the autobiography takes a sudden turn as if the author is representing his own political education. In several cogently argued pages, he contends that even if Polish Jewry's troubles are caused by the Depression, these troubles will be rendered permanent by state policies designed to push or keep Jews out of society. By contrast, there is the issue where a Jew, quote, whether he is a worker or a merchant or a clerk, can realize himself. The author goes on to say, quote, in short, you live in your own state. And he expresses his wish for a piece of land of my own. And he closes by offering a sobering analysis of where the rest of the world is going toward economic nationalism that will leave no place for a Jewish middle class. This first autobiography records the alchemy whereby a sense of foreclosed personal life chances could be transmuted first into Palestinism and then into a general status Zionism and a cogent prognosis about worsening collective prospects in the diaspora. A second autobiography written in 1939 is even more interesting. It is written in Hebrew, yet its author, despite being the product of a very fine Hebraist education, declares himself a cosmopolitan, an anti-nationalist who loathes, quote, all the various sorts of rituals of nationalism and the tradition of every people, end quote. But his dreams that, quote, every border and every nationalist extremism can be abolished, end quote, have been dashed, above all, by his observation of German Jewry's plight across the border. And this has pushed him towards seeing his salvation, quote, in my Jewish solution, in Zionism, end quote. He is no Zionist, he assures the reader, but a political realist who sees the Yeshuv, quote, as a place of refuge in the meantime until I am able to fight for social equality and for cosmopolitanism, end quote. What's interesting to me here is not that one of these young men became a Zionist and the other didn't on their own account, but rather the convergence of their thought around a shared political analysis despite their difference in party affiliation. So far, I've talked about non-Zionists, but this convergence points us toward thinking a bit differently about Polish Zionism, the organized kind, too. All of the sorts of attitudes toward the Yeshuv as distinct from Zionism, toward territory as such, as distinct from Eretz Yisrael, toward Palestinism or immigrationism, born of despair about any future in Poland, all of these were also pervasive among many of those who did join the Zionist movement, especially in the early 1930s. To give one example, when Lova Levita came from Poland in 1929 as a kibbutz emissary, he described the forces driving the growth of the Zionist youth pioneer movement thus, quote, The forces that are driving our youth and its masses to our movement are somewhat different from those we once knew. And he had left uh, Eastern Europe in the immediate wake of the Russian Revolution, 1918, 1919. Not the storminess of the era, not the wars and social movements, not civic life, and not idea-driven reflection. Rather, the youth sees with complete clarity, cannot fail to see what their parents also understand but struggle to deny namely the total lack of a foundation for their continued existence here. All of the vaporousness and insecurity that adheres in all their dealings, from this derives the desire to leave this as quickly as possible, to escape, end quote. In 1933, a few years later, another Hechelutz emissary, Mem Kliegel, wrote to the Hechelutz Poland's central office in Warsaw to report an interesting duality among youth in the Volin province who had, in fact, joined Hechelutz, a Zionist youth organization. On the one hand, Klieger was frustrated to discover that there was no interest in Hebrew culture or cultural life of any sort, poetry, song, declamation. But, quote, on the other hand, there is awareness and interest to a degree I've not encountered in discussions, in the study aspect. To study, to know, is a desire among most of them, end quote. And he goes on to specify that, that he's clearly talking about political sociological questions bearing on the globe and the Jewish place in it, the threat of war, the details of the international situation. In short, here we have Polish Jewish young people driven to Hechalutz, not by any investment in Zionist cultural visions, but by a desire to understand the political situation of the world and of themselves in it. Now here, a point about what Zionism and non-Zionism in Poland had in common. Much of the historiography on Polish Jewry and Zionism tends to imagine Zionism as a kind of core group with weak edges made up of escapists or rescue Zionists 
who came to Zionism, Zionism as things got worse in Poland and left as things got worse in Palestine. There's some truth to this, certainly. But it might make a good deal of sense to see many Polish Jews, both Zionists and non-Zionists, as wrestling not only with their relationship to the Yeshuv, but also a shared set of growing doubts about their situation in Poland, in the diaspora, regardless of what the Yeshuv could offer. That is, perhaps we should understand wide swaths of Polish Jewry, both Zionists and non-Zionists, in terms of a creeping post-diasporism. Let me sketch three particular political cultural phenomena that I would call post-diasporas. First, there was a widespread sense among contemporaries of all political stripes that by the 1930s, many and even most Polish Jews had given up on hopes for a good future in Poland. Full stop. Iwit Czerniawski records the observation that whenever someone from a small town managed to emigrate to a new country, however unfamiliar, Uruguay, Colombia, the entire shtetl was consumed by a mania to leave for the same place. In 1936, the, co the cooperative movement activist uh, and a diasporist, Mayor Polner, stated as a matter of sad fact that, quote, the broad masses see their only salvation in emigration, end quote. Although the Yiddish novelist Michal Burstyn was a committed diasporist, his fiction of the 1930s is replete with depictions of the same perspective. In one story, when a rather characterless uh, fellow who's made Aliyah to Palestine 15 years later returns to his Polish hometown, his presence reveals one shared belief among everyone in the town, that any young people who can should leave Poland immediately. So everyone's trying to set up their daughters with them, not out of any romantic aspirations, but because it's a way to get out. The story culminates <coughs> with a Shai Agnon-like encounter with Rochela, the beautiful and intelligent daughter of the town's wealthiest man, now ruined, quote, it's boring in the shtetl, she says. Studying is not worthwhile, and she doesn't like to sit around doing nothing. Everything is disintegrating here. She wants to build something lasting of her own, end quote. A second dimension that I think we can identify as framing a kind of general post-diasporism is the conviction that anti-Semitism is a defining characteristic of the Jewish tradition and the desire simply to escape having to live with it. Here, let me cite another uh, youth autobiography drawn from this very rich source space that we can talk about. This autobiography is largely given over to discussions of, the young man, of a young man's internal struggles over identity, religion, sexuality, with almost no political content. Then, at the end of the autobiography, out of nowhere, the young man announces that, quote, I would travel to Eretz Israel without hesitation, end quote. He disclaims any positive Zionist ideals. Rather, what has awakened me to this, to this dire desire for Aliyah, is purely and simply the anti-Semitic comments of the Polish youth with whom he periodically interacts. We find this same formulation elsewhere, for instance, by a Hasidic memoirist, a devotee of the Skernowitz Rebbe, who recalls his conversation with the Rebbe, quote, I began to reveal to him the story of my long-developing longings for the land of Israel because life among the wicked Poles, Poles had become un unendurable to me, end quote. And this points to a third and final dimension of post-diasporism, a deepening disconnect between the realm of Jewish identity and culture on the one hand and the realm of political imagination on the other. We're used to writing about Polish Jews as culturally engaged to the very end, Yiddishists versus Hebraists, secularists versus, secularists versus Orthodox, but many sources suggest something very different. In 1935, the 21-year-old Benjamin Reich from Bielsk sent Max Weinreich a detailed personal response to Weinreich's scholarly work on Polish Jewish youth. This young man was in every way a perfect candidate for Yiddishism, mocking his own Hebraist schooling he paints Hebraism as cognitively harmful and silly. He declares Yiddish our language, as opposed to Goyish, meaning here Polish, and proclaims that Jewish youth should support Yiddishist institutions. But Benjamin Reish proves to be a Yiddishist who wasn't. Even as he sounds certain Yiddishist notes, he methodically disclaims the significance or even the possibility of a Yiddishist vision of culture. Indeed, his entire discussion of culture as such is interwoven with a sense that there is no Jewish future of any sort and certainly no future for Jewish culture in Poland. Thus, though he declares his support for the YIVO Institute, the Yiddishist Research Institute, he simultaneously notes that the work can have no practical effect because, quote, practical reforms of any significant dimension are impossible in the present order in general and our diaspora life in particular. Elsewhere, he writes, Studying and researching the situation will not in, self, in itself brighten matters for us. And he ultimately insists that the old distinctions of culture, identity, or ideology that defined Jewish modernity are basically irrelevant. Ultimately, the only meaningful distinction left to Jews in his era is the distinction between useful and useless options for trapped individuals. In this context, he offers an, in, an inchoate post diasporous politics in response to Weinreich's diasporism. 
Whereas Weinreich had suggested that the sense of crisis among Polish-Jewish young people was largely a response to economic troubles, no different in essence from that of young Polish or other European youth. Benjamin Reich responds, but it's nonsense to compare the situation of, Polish youth to the, of Jewish youth to the situation of Polish youth. The Poles feel themselves to be rulers here in the land, but we Jews began to feel a specific national oppression even before the crisis. True, he acknowledges Weinreich's charge. Zionism is for, is for many young people a, quote, psychological salvation, end quote. But most of those who have joined Hechelutz out of these psychological moments are not satisfied with this psychological salvation. They come to want to save themselves, and he is evidently one of them. Critical of Zionism's pretensions about new Jews, he is himself nevertheless a Zionist of a new sort, or perhaps better put, a Palestinist, or even an emigrationist. I hope that my sketch today demonstrates that this bloodless term, non-Zionism, actually conceals worlds of tumultuous thinking about Zionism among Polish Jews of every sort, intense debate, intense thinking, intense doubt, defined by simultaneous reflection on the Yeshuv and the diaspora alike. And this is not merely, it seems to me, a matter of the history of Zionism. A few thoughts in conclusion. Looking beyond Zionism per se, first, let me suggest a point regarding Jewish nationalism more generally. Taking into account both the Zionist and the broadly territorialist choices and impulses we've seen, it seems that we should consider the possibility that interwar Jewish nationalism was increasingly a nationalism not of nationalist conviction, but of political calculus and political desperation, shaped above all by the newly pertinent question, where is my future? Under what conditions do I have a future? The answers young Jews gave to this question were largely severed from any pre-existing grounding in a coherent ideology, nationalist or non-nationalist. They were discontinuous with the institutions and ideologies of pre-war Zionism. I sometimes note to my students that an American Jewish kid, or American non-Jewish kid, uh, has more access to Zionist theory by looking at Hertzberg's Zionist idea than most of these kids ever did. They simply didn't, you know, it wasn't there to look for this sort of stuff. So not coming to it out of reading in, in their way into it, at least many of them aren't. Um, they were, th these, these modes of, of Jewish nationalism were discontinuous with diaspora nationalism, uh, any other organized Jewish movement, and they were framed by a growing sense that nationhood was one's political horizon whether one liked it or not. In other words, these Jews were not becoming national in that sort of Baumanian, Foucauldian, conversionist sense of growing false consciousness that the term increasingly applies, but were coming to political con conclusions through an act of ideologically underspecified political reason, faced with global developments and decisions over which neither these everyday Jews, nor Zionist leaderships, nor other Jewish leaderships had any sort of control. The nationalism of Poles and others in the new successor states, the nation-statism of the new international system, the crisis of capitalism, anti-Semitism is a growing force. Further, this history suggests that we need not just a different account of Jewish nationalism to make sense of all this, but also a new account of Jewish politics as such. We're used to defining Jewish politics as highly ideological and sectarian, but the evidence presented here suggests something very different. A Jewish politics denuded of thick ideological reflection and driven instead by frank desperation and reasoning about the future in the context of a loss of any certainties about it other than that it is likely to get worse. And finally, a point about how we write Jewish history, especially East European Jewish history. One of the chief reasons that people study East European Jewish history is its cultural plenitude, the intense internal dialogue that East European Jews conducted for some 150 years regarding the fate of Judaism and Jewish identity in the modern world. My own first book on the idea of modern Jewish culture participated in this mode of study, and I don't want to discourage anyone else from taking it up. But the kinds of sources I'm studying now point to a different dimension of Jewish modernity. The history of Jewish political culture in the 1930s suggests a growing sense among Polish Jews that the guiding assumptions with which they had entered the 20th century might have become untenable or even might have been wrong all along. That Jews might not be able to secure any of the competing modernities they had hoped for in their various competing movements. Raymond Williams once defined tragedy as, quote, the slowly settling loss of any acceptable future, end quote. The sources I have sketched today suggest that precisely this sort of tragedy needs to be brought to the center of our histories of Jewish modernity. Even as we continue to attend to Jewish agency, we must focus, too, on the less ennobled regions of the modern Jewish experience, and the modern experience as such, marked by extrusion that brought with it felt degradation, hopelessness, futurelessness, and the new kinds of thinking that emerged out of such a tragic consciousness. Thank you.
question? Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Please. Yeah, thanks for this really rich and fascinating talk. There are a lot of questions uh, that arise for me, but perhaps a short and simple one. Uh, in the dispatches that were coming from travelers to Palestine, uh, back to Poland, uh, you, you've talked about a lot of various uh, contexts in which these were all being written, in which they were being received. Uh, but one thing you didn't mention, which seems like the obvious omission, is what were they saying, if at all, about the Palestinian population that Jews were encountering when they moved to Palestine? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, and I skipped it because it would be in a different paper, or a much, or more, much longer paper. But let me say, but let me use the opportunity, um, and I'll talk about Weinreich. There's some very interesting things to say about it. Um, Actually, in a way, I skip Weinreich because I think to analyze what he has to say, one would need a very different kind of methodological lens. Because for Weinreich, what's interesting about his treatment of the Jewish-Arab question in Palestine is that he doesn't, he doesn't render it clear even in his own mind, certainly on his own presentation. And in fact, the thing that's really fascinating about it is the way he moves incredibly fluidly back and forth between um, representing the Palestinians as dangerous, as, as versions of Ukrainians, probably speaking, as a dangerous peasant majority that's very violent, and representing the Jews as Poles, that is, as an emerging dominant nationality that is also potentially violent. So there's a very interesting moment. And, and you know, I would, Weinreich was a smart and a careful guy, and usually I would sort of give him the benefit of the doubt that he meant to do whatever he said. But what's fascinating is these just shift back and forth in his text in really striking ways, sometimes modulated by sort of the voice of someone is telling him this, and he's reflecting on it, sometimes by his own kind of, obviously it's mediated, sort of down and published it, but his own sort of sense of what he's seeing. So he sees a, um, um, uh, an Arab teacher with a group of school kids from one of the village schools uh, and, um, and, you know, uh, taking a kind of that tour, and he's reminded of sort of the claims, the sort of the kinds of competing nationalist claims to place that he knows in Eastern Europe, and he immediately associates them with, um, uh, uh, with Polish or Ukrainian nationalists talking about what's really theirs, right? And then he has, at the same time, a kind of ability to recognize, for instance, in a case of a, he's talking to a young woman who had studied in Paris, or in Europe somewhere, um, and she notes to him, uh, and he comments on this with some irony, obviously, that she had plenty of relations with Arab fellow students in Paris, but that there's no framework for such relations here. And he sort of meditates on what that might mean for thinking about inter-ethnic relations. Um, and you can, you can contextualize that by, I mean, what's interesting there is his own ambivalence and his own ambiguity in his own thought. And that certainly um, is at odds with, but also I, to my mind more interesting than, extremes you find in other kinds of reportage. So the Bundes reportage from Palestine was consistently a kind of, um, you know, an expose mode. And they wanted to show how ridiculous and unworkable the whole thing was and that they wanted to show it was really dead now and they kept going and saying, now it's dead. Um, and for them, it was clear that the Palestinians were uh, anti-colonial. This was an anti-colonial movement, uh, and um, if some pogrom elements had crept into 29, this was a kind of inevitable side effect of something that was best understood through a certain kind of emerging Marxist anti-colonialism. Um, you know, and then Zionist reportage will often say the opposite, right? But but Weinreich's reportage speaks to that larger question. Let me take a step back and say, I assume behind your question is a larger question: what to what degree was the thinking at all? about this question in, in Poland among Jews. And I would say that you know, I've been looking for it, and there certainly was some. Um, and one of the things you see from the shlichim, the emissaries to Jewish youth in Poland from Palestine is um, that some young people want to talk about it. That's sort of one of the five things they really want to talk about when they want to talk about Palestine. Um, Beyond that, though, it's a little hard to pin down what it is they knew or read or really cared about. And I think that probably if I scrape long and deep enough, which I am trying to do, probably most people kind of thought what was once, you know, that the apocryphal but probably correct, I mean, sort of broadly accurate uh, to, say, to say this claim was made. There was a, a figure, I forget who it's attributed to, but there's a Zionist figure who someone was assistantly asking him about the, uh, the Arab question. He said, well, first we have to solve the Jewish question. You know, that was, um, and you know, push came to shove. I think for many of these young people, that was essentially the answer. But you know, these are questions that have to be further further researched. Yeah, Mon. Um, 
So I'm quite interested. I've often thought of the later migration waves that you're talking about here as non-Zionist migration waves. I think I've taught them that way. Um, so in a sense, I think my thinking was sort of following along with you up to a certain point. We're uh, proceeding. Kicking up the door. Yeah. But, but I think where I, when I had framed it that way in my mind, it was because the United States closed its door, so people were desperate to go out when wherever they could, and therefore a non-Zionist migration to any possible way out. You twist that in a really interesting way, because what you said was that they become nationalists because there's sort of no other choice. That, that in the decision to go there, because all other doors close, in essence they become Palestinist or Zionist or pro-nationalist or some other framework. So I guess what I was, if I were going to turn this into a question, it would be to what extent do you see, um, and the United States didn't factor into your story at all, but to what extent yeah, do you see the kind of growing refugee crisis and the shutting of doors to be, in a sense, creating a nationalism which is left out of the version that I used to teach. But. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I mean, I think there's no, there's simply no question that that was a key dimension. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I want to modulate that. I, you know, I did, I mean, it's, I think I'd want to, if I had a lot more time, I know I've took, taken a lot already, I would want to modulate more carefully how I see the relation between sort of pol a politics of exit. We need to get out. I'll go anywhere. It'll be Argentina, Palestine, Uruguay, or, or whatever. Um, not everybody who said that kind of, went through the same process of becoming anything particular. At the same time, not the, what I wanted to say was I, don't, I think that even those who were um, thinking of leaving, especially in the kind of fifth Aliyah period, that moment of 32 to mid-35, and even a little bit earlier, because things are sort of reopening in, in, in um, 30, 31, you know, as soon as you're thinking about leaving, you, know, you don't think, now I'm going to leave, then you say, well, where should I go and should I think about it? You know, you're thinking about these things, is my sense, simultaneously and duratively and recursively. You, you say, well, so Palestine's a possibility. What does that involve, right? And, um, um, and you couldn't help but be at least partially compelled by the possibility that some of what they said about how, it, how different it was as a kind of Jewish community might be true, right? So in some sense, you, you engage in thinking about a national community or a nationalist community or a community framed by nationalism that was also uniquely open to you um, in a way that others might not be, right? And so um, I think there's a kind of a, a structure in which Especially then and there, and for those people, there's a um, uh, there's a natural, um, a very large space of between pure politics of exit and committed Zionism, right? Where people are sort of thinking about it, and as they think about it, they end up also thinking about their situation in Poland in in its light, and that's kind of what I wanted to get at. And I would say that um, I think it's actually important in a way that these that Polish Jews at this juncture, and this is really a kind of very much a 1929 to 36 paper, although I crept into the late 30s. They're not actually refugees in the way that German Jews after Nazism are, right? I mean, you know, the classic case in the sort of fifth Aliyah, non-nationalist emigration to Zionism was a German Jew who woke up one morning and being convinced all his life that he was a German Jew, and, you know, he was no longer part of the national community, he had to get out at some fundamental level. And, and it, there's a, just as I didn't mention the, um, what the reportage has to say about um, the relations of Jews and Arabs and the Palestinian population, there's also very interesting things about these East European Jews looking at German Jews who just arrived. And understanding that they have a much more wrenching and bizarre encounter with this, you know, with this new world in all sorts of ways, and um, at the same time taking them in a way as the best argument. I mean, Weinreich, for instance, never embraces Zionism and is not interested in um, going that far. But he kind of acknowledges in his essay on the German Jews that they really don't have a choice. He really thinks of them as people who truly have nowhere else to go, and you know, right, um, uh, and, and writes a very admiring essay about the young guy who organized the um, Youth Aliyah, who was later famous for banning the Beatles in Israel, but, but at the time he was a real hero. Um, strange history. Um, um, but that's, that's not quite your question. I guess I would say something like this, that in the 30s, that, that's part of the other part of the answer is in the 30s, as the issue becomes a real place, with, and there's more and more threads tying people to it, they hear from family members or distant, you know, distant relatives, friends. They read this reportage. And so there's ways in which they can think about it in a way that, you know, um, someone just trying to get out of Poland because they want to make a better living for themselves and going to Argentina, there was not even a structure to, you know, they might be interested in Argentina. There's interesting sources about, you can, there's people taking Spanish lessons in the 30s and 20s. But, you know, you, just didn't, you didn't have a framework in which the national question was forcefully imposed on these other, these, these kinds of personal decisions. Um, so um, I'm so curious in connecting these, these two questions. Um, I'm thinking in, in 1936, the um, uh, Polish authorities in Tarnopol 
um, give a sort of overview of attitudes of Jews in that area of Eastern Galicia. And they say, the Jews are not really interested in what's happening in Poland. The two, they are completely disconnected from mm. politics in Poland. The two things that interest them. First is what is happening in Danzig, and the second is the Arab rebellion. Mm. And the, that sort of connects to these two issues. Um, there is a great deal of interest in what is happening in Palestine, but particularly because people want to go there. And they know that with the Arab uprising in Palestine, the British government is bound to respond by closing the immigration down. And so there's a great deal. This is not Zionism in the traditional sense, right. but it is a wish to go there and an inability to go. And the polls looking, the administrators uh, getting their reports from, the, from all the prefects in the little towns are saying that's what they're constantly talking about. The second is what is happening in Danzig because that means that the Polish government will not protect them or in fact is moving yeah. toward, of course, some yeah. kind of agreement with the, or reconciliation or some kind of arrangement of the Jews with Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing here is that there is, um, I was thinking about all the letters you were quoting, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's an interesting correspondence about the Shomer Atzeir. Um, and uh, the, the worry of the main uh, mainstream Zionist authorities in Galicia at the time is that the Shomer Tzair is saying we will go to Palestine so as to create a social revolution there mm -hmm. in which there will be solidarity between J Jewish and Arab mm -hmm. workers. We will create a social revolution for, for the two nations together. And the Zionist authorities are terrified because they need money raising, which reminds you of you know, universities today. So they don't want this on their hands, and they say, we have to shut this down. We have to. So again, this is not about ideological Zionism. It is about the practicality of moving people from one place to another. And the last point that I'm really interested in, because you didn't talk about it so much, it's not the impact so much of, the, of, of closing the gates in the United States, but the impact of uh, the integral nationalism in Poland, and particularly in Eastern Poland, of, of the Ukrainians. Mm, yeah. That has, from what my reading, that has a huge impact on how Jews start thinking about nationalism as integral nationalism. It's, it's, it's not simply whether they have a place in Poland, whether there's anti-Semitism or not, it is that they are factored out of it. They're simply not part of the struggle between Ukrainians and Poles is a nationalist struggle. The Jews don't even feature in it. They're completely taken out of the formula. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, let me just say, I'm not sure I have an answer. That, that's a great point. And I, I'm, I have been trying to understand what people are thinking about Ukrainian nationalism. Probably your, your vantage from sort of the ground is a much better way of thinking about that. I mean, the it's mentioned consistently, and it's a given in the in the kind of slightly kind of the, the sort of um, publicistic writing on the situation from a distance. It's self-evident the Ukrainians are more um, robustly and exclusively anti-Semitic, and the minds of these of, of observers, people like Leshinsky, take that for granted. Um, and it's self-evident that Jews, uh, that Ukrainians, are inimical to. Jews in some way, and for, but, but at the same time, it was, the funny thing is I also see, and this might just be people with very weird blinders on, there's actually also, they're also kind of inspired by the Ukrainian case. There's a very interesting uh, 1936 moment, but not just Zionists. I'm sorry, this is not really an answer to your question, but just parenthetically. Um, there's this guy, Mayor Polner, this co-op activist, and he actually says, there's no future for, I say this in my paper to Mars, there's no future for us uh, in political struggle. We're, there's, there's no political framework for us to get any, to do anything on our own behalf here in Poland. But what we can do is, like the Ukrainians, we can, grant the political realm is foreclosed, and, and um, try and aim for economic autarky. And he has this whole co-op vision of, uh, and, you know, he understands what they've been able to do, um, even without, in some sense, having the state in their hands. But he doesn't let the other shoe drop and say, what would happen if they did have a state? You, know, you don't have a sense of a guy who knows what the, OUN is going to look like, and I, that's an interesting point. And I really need to understand why they don't know, why they don't, or why only some know. Parenthetically, Dan Heller, uh, I haven't read the work, but he's writing about the revisionist movement um, in a kind of ground-up way uh, at the University of Toronto or McGill, and he um, 
he once let drop to me that there's a lot of material on um, uh, a partial exception to your point about no place for Jews, which is that some of the Polish border units increasingly were willing to work with revisionist kids who wanted military training and stuff like that to suppress bandits, right, Ukrainian. And so there's an interesting way in which, in a certain, from a certain vantage of the East, you can still imagine Polish nationalism is actually more capacious, even in the late 30s. That's at least what he told me. I don't know what he finds, but it's a great point. Um, there are other things to, do you want to me to, okay, we'll talk it over dinner. Um, Adam, then R Rochelle, then I don't know if there's, I, wanted, I didn't want to exclude this side of the room, but did you, but is this a, a very strongly relevant? Oh, yeah. My, a minor question. You kept on speaking about referring to citing Mein Life. Could you just tell us a little bit about him, including his first name? Max Feinrich. Max, Max why, why were you quoting him so extensively uh, or referring to him? Well, I think he's an interesting thinker, but uh, probably um, I would say there are two reasons for that. One is that he is, of all of the many figures who tried to conduct research, real empirical research, into the lives and thought of Polish Jewish youth, he was far and away the best place to do so early because he had a, a unique access to a body of what began as several dozen and soon grew to several hundred autobiographies by Jewish young people that were collected across Poland uh, in, at various junctures in the 30s. So in a way, he's, um, you know, he's the closest thing you'll find to someone who is functioning like a qualitative sociologist of Polish-Jewish youth in Poland on the, at the time. So the book I cited from the Wegsons Jugend is, it's many things, um, and it's framed not as a study of Polish Jewish youth, but as a prolegomenon to the study of Polish Jewish youth, but in its 240 pages, there is a great deal of work on what he himself is finding in these autobiographies. So he's a uniquely rich source uh, for um, trying to make some kinds of inroads in understanding what Polish Jewish young people were thinking, although I'm not the only one. Uh, and I also think he's a very interesting guy. So he wrote this very interesting reportage. And my interests are primarily as an intellectual historian. So I don't, I'm not terribly concerned with what he represents or doesn't represent. I think he represents mostly himself, but he's a very interesting figure for thinking about what's going on in diasporous thought. As a small footnote intended mostly for the youngest people here, there is a man in our temple locally whose name is Weinreich, who is a boy, as a boy, was on the last ship to get out of Danzig uh, before the invasion of Germany. Maybe before Germany. Could be a distant relation because the Weinreich family was actually, a, they were from the German speaking parts of what had been Russian Latvia. So who knows? Adam, then Rachel, then. Thank you. It was really a wonderful, wonderful talk and reframing sort of stuff that we've talked about for decades in a new way. It's a, it's a really marvelous achievement and I'm really blown Thanks. away by what you said. Um, I have sort of three small thoughts. Um, I don't lay a great, right towards the end, you talked about a little bit on the Polish context, <coughs> of that these Polish Jews are affected by what's going on in Poland. So I'm, I'm, you're thinking about this sort of no way out thing. Poland itself is in a similar situation. And Poles themselves are wondering what their future is going to be. And I wonder if there isn't some kind of it's not going to be direct because the situations are not the same, but some kind of fertilization of, of despair, thinking about despair. And certainly from what you said, and you said it yourself, I think, towards the end, the way Jews thought about solving their problem seems to have been quite similar to the way Poles thought about solving their problem, um, at least internally, not externally, because Germany and the Soviet Union was a, was a unique thing. Um, I, I wonder if you talk about post diasporism and Palestinian, all these isms. It seems to me you're working against yourself because what you're positing is a non-political, a non-ideological way of looking at nationalism, right? It's not an ism in that sense. I don't know if I'm being clear. I, you're sure, but I had to come up with a title. So I want, I mean, and taking that a little further, Interestingly, I thought that what they're building on is an inchoate sense of Jewish, of group Jewish identity. Right? They, that's what they have. That's not, I mean, that's not new. That's extremely old. 
and they're using it. That's what's driving them, I think, towards a Jewish state rather than any, an anywhere solution, right? Territorial, territory. There is, that's very strong, this group identity, okay? Uh, so I, I wonder if that needs to be explored a little bit more to understand really what that, in the context of what you're saying, right? Because I think it's what's driving the whole thing. Um, and lastly, um, so in an odd way, their solution is a very Zionist. Isn't it Herzl's solution? Isn't that the way Herzl saw Zionism? Yeah, so, well, and so in fact, it, it, in a kind of, I'm saying the opposite of what I just said, right? But this is actually a very Zionist solution. This is the way Herzl understood Zionism as a response to anti-Semitism. I mean, Herzl was even more was optimistic about it, suggesting that the anti-Semites would actually help the Jews go. Which and the way fact, actually plays out in Poland. It's it's like it's like not in practical right? terms. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and, and finally, as, as a last thing, and I think as a kind of counterbalance, um, how many Polish, what percentage of Polish youth took a step, a positive step, towards leaving? I mean, oh. the whole shtetl talking about it, all right, you can talk, right. but joining Hechalutz, going on a training scheme, joining the path, you know, there were ways that you could work up to it, and in fact, my sense is that most of them didn't. So. Yeah, sure. So what, does that, not what does that mean in, in your argument? Those are my thoughts. That, that, those were not, first of all, those were not three questions. There were five questions, and they were not small. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, right, great, great questions. And, and, and some, I suppose, speak for themselves. I mean, for instance, the one about aren't there ways in which Jewish nationalism ends up looking like Polish nationalism? I think, yes. Um, um, very much so. And it may, may have something to do with integral nationalism, it may have something to do with direct kinds of impact and emulation. Um, um, I tend to think it's the former, but rather than sort of the influence of Polish. But I, you know, Marco Silber, for instance, as you know, is working on um, this more particular histor political historical question, political cultural question of in what ways were, were, was Zionist thought actually shaped by thinking about the Polish situation as a kind of model and anti-model. David Engel has done some of the same stuff. And, and you know, clearly it was. Uh, that said, I don't really see much evidence in the sources I'm looking at of um, deep engagement with the Polish political scene, one way or the other. Partially because the political scene is is somewhat, I mean, it's sort of, it's only a partially functional parliamentary democracy, as you know, and it's really it's hard for people to work to work up the enthusiasm to worry all that much about the local political scene when when clearly there's very attenuated kinds of ways in which they can have anything to do with it. But but. But that's not really a full answer, and I'll have to think about that. Too many isms. Um, well, I don't, I'm not sure I want, I don't, certainly don't want to say, I hope I, I didn't come away, leave you, leave you with the sense that I want to argue this was an, a, an apolitical universe of thought. I mean, I think it was a very political universe. So people said in very, um, in many different ways, they reflected on their situation and became kind of sidewalk sociologists of how the world was going to start working in the near future and what that would mean for them. And, ended up wrestling with the relationship of um, uh, things that we think of as kind of classic questions of, in, the, in, in, in modern social scientific explanation about the relation of the economic and the political. I mean, they, they you know, in, in many ways, I would say the opposite. This was, this was an intensely, this was the, the generalization of political thinking across many different spheres that we tend not to think of as political thought. That's not the same as saying they should be called an ism. And that maybe the, Palestinism is my way in part because it's a term people are using to capture a phenomenon that they're trying to name and understand. And, and to take one step back, I mean, one of the things I do in the, in the or will be doing in the book that's maybe less clear here is that um, the book has more of an intellectual history focus on some, partially the ways just that observers of all this, including someone like Feinreich, but many others, are just trying to understand what they're seeing. They have a sense of tremendous change, a sense of the old order of Polish Jewish life is collapsing, but they don't themselves fully know how to name and describe what they're looking at and explain it. And so a lot, um, you know, um, they're challenged by the same problems we are as historians in a way uh, on the ground, except there's a more urgent. Um, the ground of Jewish identity is a ground of, of this stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, up, up to a point, I think you're right. Um, that said, you know, there's an interesting t tension here that I only just touched on in the fig this, fig this young figure at the end, the Benjamin Reich. Um, um, there is the question, one of the questions that's hurled, one of the charges that's hurled at youth Zionism is, well, this is an individualist response to our problem. You're leaving, but we're all stuck here, right? Um, and that's that's wrong. We need to stay here and work collectively. Um, and so that you know, there, and and there is a kind of the claim of individual aspiration that gets brought up here by some of the participants um, in all of this. I'm not quite sure I want to go say that you know 
it's the ground of Jewish collective identity. It's driving him toward a Jewish collective um, decision. I think there are plenty of people who, under other circumstances, would have been perfectly happy to go to the U.S., perfectly happy to go to Argentina, but um, they are being, you know, moved toward a world in which the real opportunities are in Palestine, and those are different kinds of opportunities that need to be reflected upon. That said, of course, I don't deny that, you know, if there hadn't been a strong, um, you know, um, sort of identification at some level, whether by, uh, by choice or by necessity, surely uh, things would have looked a lot different. I mean, I grant you that, right? It's not German Jewry, and that is an important distinction. Um, that is a matter of degree. And finally, speaking of matters of degree, uh, how many? Well, I mean, I'm not, you know, part of my answer to that is I'm not actually trying to say this was true of everybody or it's true of 40%. I think that if indeed it's true that somewhere between 70 and 100,000 Polish Jewish youth over the course of the 30s joined Hechalutz, that's actually quite an extraordinarily large number of people. I mean, to go out and bother to join. I, but, you know, how you, but what percentage it is, it's not, it's, uh, well, what's uh, 100,000 out of 3 million, right? I mean, it's not that many uh, if you want large numbers, right? Um, and, but, you know, you can always cut those statistics very differently, right? So the, if, you, if you look at electoral statistics, um, you get these amazing disparities. So uh, the, in 22, I think it is, when the, 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 the free, uh, the, the elections, um, the Jewish National Bloc, organized by Greenwald, gets 75% of the, of the vote for Jewish parties. But, on, but when, you, when Polish Jews in Warsaw are asked to declare their um, language, only... 5.6% say Hebrew, which is the mark of a true Zionist. So somewhere between 5.6% and 75% of the Warsaw population was willing at various junctures to kind of align itself with Zionism up to some point. You know, which, which just tells us a kind of Rubeckerian point, which is there's this huge range of kinds of identification with the national. Um, and what we need to do is think about as much about it, the kind of context in which you make those identifications as about what people really think. That would be um, the answer there. Okay. <laughs> I'm counting this time. Okay, okay, okay. It's a okay. Okay. So the first one, the first one I want to relate to what Moses asked, and just to say that the first Bundists who immigrated to Palestine did it on did it in 1924 as a way to get out of Poland because they couldn't go to America. They didn't found a Bund movement until okay. 1951. But they acted as Bundists, mm -hmm. strikes, and especially they created the Union of Bakers, but they acted as Bundists mm -hmm. in Petah Tikva and in other Moshavot uh, uh, around Petah Tikva and Tel Aviv. But they were, they were Bundists, uh, and they went to Palestine. So this is one. The, sec uh, the second and the third, I would suggest to take, uh, to consider the trans-regional uh, dimension and to take into consideration two other uh, factors, and I would like to ask you um, if you took them into account. So the first one is 1931, um, the creation of Mapai, and right after the creation of Mapai, Ben Gurion puts, in a brutal way, puts pressure on the Labour Zionist movement in Poland as well as in America to merge and to create one big working class that works in favor of Palestine. So my question to you is, how do you think this affected uh, the status of Zionism in Jewish-Polish society? The second uh, aspect that I would uh, consider is that right after the emergence of Mapai, in 1932, <coughs> you said Hachalutz in Poland. So let's look at a country where there is no pressure, there is future, second generation of labor Zionism in America. We now, um, the creation of Habonim, 1932, huge enrollment, and again the same, ex the exact same phenomenon. A very low number of, card, of, of party card holders uh, in addition to the fact that during the 20s, labor Zionism in America deteriorates. And the Histadrut and Palestine actually takes control over it and puts a lot of pressure on its activities. And here we have this emergence of Habonim, which is the same idea as a Chalutz, also the same Hachsharot. And my question is, 
what is the role of youth culture in this phenomena? Yeah, that's a great question. So, the Bundes Union of Bakers. Um, uh, well, I'll just talk. I'll ask you more about them later. Um, um, how to turn that into a question in the sense that, um, um, well, I guess certainly there are people making uh, Aliyah or emigrating to Palestine, in this case, emigrating to Palestine, who are not only not convinced but are genuinely, you know, at odds with the project. There's no question about that. And that, that's also true for the same reason at the same time. There's family reunification. I mean, um, Gittel Meisel, Nachman Meisel's sister, uh, went there to take care of her father, right? And he, went, he was a religious fellow who went, she went there. She was a, basically a communist all through the 20s. So there's, there's no question. And, um, um, and you know, the, many of the people doing the kind of reportage I'm talking about, when they go, their natural constituency are, and their informants are to some degree um, uh, um, people very much at odds with the kind of organizing Zionist principles of the issue. But I would, I mean, I'm not sure this is really an answer to your question, but just maybe an, an additional wrinkle that's kind of interesting, which is that one of the things I also didn't mention about Weinreich, but, but I see very, as very striking, and actually much more common even than the kinds of political reflection I see, is there's tremendous enthusiasm, tremendous admiration for the Histadrut among most of the people I've read, including many of the non-Zionists, if they're socialists. So that the, the gimme, the obvious thing for them, is, is it's obviously true that the kibbutz is great, and it's obviously true that the Histadrut is awesome. Right? That's and, and sort of a model for what the Bund would like to do in some ways. That, you know, and, and it, they, though they don't say that very openly. So, you know, there is no question that there is some kind of more complicated story of a transnational socialism playing out in both directions here. And, um, I would agree, um, and I need to think further about what that would entail. Um, how does the creation of the the, the Mapai sort of um, demarche and, and Ben Gurion's pressure? How does it impact? Zionism, or how does it impact the situation I think I'm talking about? I'll take the second, because I think in a way it impacts Zionism. I mean, Zionism really is it's just a mess, right? I mean, Greenboim is the only, everyone says Greenboim is the only one who has any kind of authority or credibility outside of Galicia, and it really seems to be true. I've gotten inside the Greenboim archive, you know, you get online, actually, and you're getting these, like, these dire letters from Warsaw, there's nobody around, and yet there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who want a certificate. What do we do about it, right? Um, but Maybe that's also part of the answer is that when I look at the internal Zionist sources from Warsaw, and I'll grant that I haven't done all that much of that, I've done a little bit, they don't, and maybe it's because I'm looking a little bit later, 33, 34, but they don't register that pressure from Ben Gurion as the big deal. What they register the big deal is the fact that if they can't supply certificates, they are going to lose the youth to the revisionists, and then they'll just lose the youth altogether because that's what people really want. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's Himmel and Erden certificaten, right? That's the kind of and um, and they're very worried about all the corruption in in distributing certificates. Which of course, is, it's a it's a you know any economist would tell you, an incredibly rare and sought after resource. There will be corruption. Um, uh, so I I really see more. I do see even inside the Polish Zionist arc materials I'm looking at, which are um, letters to Greenboim and from a variety of his close associates. I, I just it's seem to me that they're more concerned with that with with problems closer to the core of what I've been talking about here than they are with, you know, this question of, of unity. Th those questions do play out in inter intra-Zionist debates also in Poland, and there's this great um, um, reportage about Polish Jewry by Alter Druyanov where he's talking about all these divisions and do they matter and don't they matter. But I think I don't see them as playing the same kind of role in shaping more popular consciousness than these much raw, more basic questions of certificates of left versus right, right uh, and, you know, uh, and so forth. Um, finally, uh, the Habonim question is a great question, uh, you know, it's, uh, and a great challenge. And I don't know enough about the Habonim side of things to um, to do much about it. Though I have, I will return to that very fine first book. Um, but I don't. Do you go that far? Is there a Habonim section in there, in the first book? On, on Poletzion, your book on, on is there a section on Habonim? Yes. Okay, I'll go back. To it. Okay, well, all right. But um, but look, I mean, I guess I would say I'm. I don't. There's no question that that there is a transnational youth culture of self-reinvention and despair about the present moment uh, and a kind of um, romantic anti-capitalism. All true and definitely should have been more clearly, squarely in the paper. And, I'm, and it's true that I'm kind of working against it, so I probably should have signaled it, it more clearly. Um, you know, to my mind, that's a, um, 
that's an explanation for the kinds of really um, um, thick investments that you see in something like Hashemer Tzair. But what I can't ignore in the sources is the very strong sense by every possible observer from every part of the Polish Jewish spectrum that the influx into, um, into Echalutz is not ideological enough. That is, this stuff's not present enough in it, and what's really there is a, is a more general sense of desperation. Right? So Now that could, of course, all of the shlichim are primed to say it's not ideological enough. They're always saying we need more education, we need more centralized control of what they're thinking and reading, all this stuff is there. So you could say they're primed to see not enough of what you would see in Hablonim, but I do think that um, in a world where it's true that there was a general youth culture of um, attraction to alternatives, so many of the sources clearly emphasize that more and more kinds of youth are being drawn in, people who would not naturally have been attracted to these sorts of things are being drawn in, um, and that it's being driven above all by the sense that the Depression may just never end for, for Polish Jews. That I don't know quite how to, how to you know, I would say the youth culture, anti, anti-capitalism was already there in the 20s, and the numbers are, of Hechelutz are about a tenth of what they are in the 30s, right? So that would be another way to think about that. that I, you know, the, it's there as a, a potential, but surely something else is is bothering them as it drives them in there, which is not to say that I, I mean, I need to think more carefully about how the youth culture dimension does, does play out. That's a, fair, that's a fair point, absolutely. And maybe one other place where we think about that, sorry, is the difference also between Hechelus on the one hand and joining Zionist youth movements on the other. Because the youth movements don't necessarily get you, Hechelus is clearly about getting a certificate for so many people, and Rona Yona is doing interesting work on, you know, these kibbutz and where, you know, these kibbutz hechshara, where a large majority of people that just wanted to get the hell out and really didn't want to live in this horrible lifestyle, which was disgusting, and you know, you know, water and no sheets. Um, and that's very different from someone joining Gordonia, I would say, right? I mean, that's a kind of, you know, and joining Gordonia is a choice that makes sense as a kind of thinking about where you, a different, a different vision of the world, whereas joining the Echalutz doesn't necessarily involve that. On that note, sorry. Okay. I want to really thank you for a really Thank you, thank you. Great questions. <laughs>